It's Kansas City, 1920. The 18-year-old fledgling artist Walt Disney has been experimenting for some time with an old borrowed camera out in the family garage. After meeting at a commercial art agency, he and Ub Iwerks try forming their own business, but it folds after barely a month, and they both go to work for the Kansas City Film Ad Company. At Film Ad, they're exposed to primitive animation techniques, and Walt and Ub learn a lot. On his own, aiming at just a local audience, Walt creates a silent short called Laughogram and gets it booked into the Newman Theater in downtown Kansas City. There's just one fully animated segment, handmade by Walt, but Newman orders more. So Walt starts making laughograms at night, wisely not letting go of his day job. While delivering laughograms and still clocking in full time at film ad, he starts on Little Red Riding Hood, the first in a series of modernized fairy tales. It takes six months to complete. Walt quits Kansas City Film Ad, rents an office, and on May 23rd, incorporates his first cartoon company, Laughogram Films. He's all of 20 years old. First on the shopping list are a used camera and his own printing and processing equipment. He persuades Ub to come and work for him, and they take out their first trade advertisement, offering a package of 12 cartoons. They aren't exactly besieged with orders, but Walt signs a contract with Pictorial Clubs, a distributor that shows educational films through churches and schools. Walt learns business the hard way when Pictorial takes delivery but pays only a fraction of what they owe. At the end of the year, he's close to shutting down, but a local dentist hires him to shoot a live action film about dental care aimed at school kids. 10 years later, Tommy Tucker's tooth is still being shown in grade schools throughout the Midwest. Walt makes a sing-along short called Song O' Real, and so meets Carl Stalling, a movie theater organist. Their paths will cross many times in future years. Disney moves into a smaller office and starts working on Alice's Wonderland, putting a live-action little girl into a cartoon world. He's also been producing short joke reels called Laughlets to avoid bankruptcy, but it isn't working. Laughogram goes under, leaving the Alice project half finished. In August, Walt packs up and moves to Los Angeles with $40 in his wallet and the Alice sample reel. He talks his brother Roy into throwing in with him, and together they set up headquarters in their uncle's garage. Meanwhile, Margaret J. Winkler, a New York cartoon distributor, is searching for new material. She orders six Alice cartoons with an option on six more. The Disneys buy a camera for $200 and rent a tiny office for 10 bucks a month. And so Alice is launched. Walt and Roy move to a vacant storefront on Kingswell Avenue and christen it the Disney Brothers Studio. After the first Alice comedy premieres, Ub Iwerks is enticed to leave Kansas City and joins the young Disney team but more help is needed. Some of the other old staffers from Kansas City link up with the Disneys in Hollywood. Two cameramen are added to the company roster, and a couple of young women are hired on as inkers and painters. One of them, Lillian Bounds, also doubles as a secretary. She catches Walt's eye, so he buys himself a new suit and goes calling on Lily. Margaret Winkler's husband, Charles Mintz, starts taking more control over her business. And by the summer of 1924, Disney finds himself almost exclusively with Mintz. December 31st, they cut a deal for the second season of Alice, 18 films this time. But Mintz also cuts the budget. On July 13th, Walt marries Lillian in Lewiston, Idaho. After the honeymoon, work begins on the fabled Hyperion Avenue studio the first time the brothers acquire a building specifically constructed to meet their animation needs. And Roy recommends that they make an important change. He thinks they ought to call it the Walt Disney Studio. A new contract with Charles Mintz on the third batch of Alice's calls for 26 of them, and they finish off their first picture in the Hyperion Studio, Alice Charms the Fish. Their cartoons start getting play dates in Europe, and the studio's output grows in stature, although Alice herself only appears in bookends to each comedy. That's because Walt is relying more and more on pure animation. Charles Mintz agrees to a new all-animated series for the next cycle of films. 
Disney settles with Mintz for 26 installments and expands his staff again while polishing off the final Alice films. From 1924 to 1927, the Disneys have created a total of 56 silent Alice cartoons. Universal says they want a lucky rabbit named Oswald. Walt and Ub get down to work, trying out different looks for the new character. They deliver the first 600-foot cartoon in April. More inkers and painters are hired, while Ub and Hugh Harmon are flying high as the chief animators. Les Clark, the first of the renowned Nine Old Men, gets welcomed aboard as a junior assistant, and the popular Oswald cartoons become a regular feature at the Colony Theater in New York City. Production on the first series of Oswalds is nearly complete. Walt goes to New York to negotiate a new deal with Charles Mintz. He's expecting a raise, but he's blindsided by Mintz's hard-nosed tactics. Walt loses the rights to the Oswald character and finds out that most of his staff has been secretly hired away from him. Mintz offers Walt a stark choice. Sign a new contract at a lower rate or he's out. Walt refuses. On the train trip home, Walt experiments with a fresh idea, a cartoon mouse. He thinks about naming him Mortimer, but Lily doesn't like it. She comes up with something better, Mickey. Walt likes the sound of it. Back in Hollywood, Ub is the only animator who sticks with Walt. And while the studio finishes out the current Oswald contract, Ub draws the mouse, giving him his distinctive quality. Disney registers the Mickey Mouse trademark on May 21st. The company owns all rights. Walt is now 26 years old. To keep his new creation a trade secret, Walt sets up a makeshift studio in his garage where the cells are inked and painted. Then they're taken to the studio and shot at night after the Oswald animators have left for the day. The first Mickey they do is plain crazy and Walt shops a sample reel around, but nobody wants it. Disney and iWorks go ahead anyway, now working with junior assistants at the studio since all the seasoned Oswald artists have gone over to Mint's. They complete the Gallop and Gaucho and then Steamboat Willie, but the distributors still aren't interested. Walt decides he needs a hook, something to set his mouse apart from the competition. He tinkers with the idea of adding sound and music, working with his old friend from Missouri, Carl W. Stalling. After the big recording companies don't want to be bothered with Walt's ideas, he finds a below-the-radar technician and works on the soundtrack with him for months in New York City. When the money runs out, his car is sold to raise funds. Steamboat Willie kicks off in the old Colony Theater in New York without a distributor. Mickey is introduced to the world on November 18th, and the little mouse makes a big splash. <laughs> 